The transfiguration of Jesus was one of the most incredible events in the Word of God. It was the glorification of the human body of Jesus. His body underwent a change in form. The event took place after Jesus revealed who he truly was. Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, a city about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, where there was a temple honoring the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. It was here that Jesus said to his followers, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Apparently, there was a lot of conjecture concerning Jesus among the spectators. Some, like Herod Antipas, believed he was the resurrected John the Baptist or one of the Old Testament prophets. But after his disciples relayed all the gossip concerning Jesus, he got to his real question. Who do you say that I am? The you here is plural, so the question was addressed to the entire group. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. Simon Peter responded quickly and correctly. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus affirmed this great confession of faith by praising God the Father for revealing this truth to Peter and blessing him. That opened the door for an announcement from Jesus. Something so amazing that even hell couldn't stop it was on its way. The Church From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. After confirming his identity to his disciples, Jesus described his mission. He told them that he had to go to Jerusalem, suffer at the hands of religious leaders, be slain, and be risen the third day. In other terms, Jesus summarized the foundation for the gospel. The Transfiguration After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as a light. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. After discussing his identity, mission, and the cost of discipleship with his disciples, Jesus led Peter, James, and his brother John up a high mountain. He was supernaturally transfigured at the time. The magnificence of the coming king and his realm was shown to these three Jewish fishermen. Now that the disciples have understood who Jesus is, the next incident follows on quite naturally. Jesus leads Peter, James, and John to the summit of the mountain, above the snow line, where he is transfigured in front of them. In describing the event, Peter says that Jesus' clothes became brighter than any bleaching agent on earth can make them. He actually uses the word detergent, or fuller, which was the equivalent in those days. The light was shining through Jesus' clothes from the inside, and they saw his glory. He met with Moses and Elijah to discuss his exodus, whereby he would accomplish a release for his people, as Luke records. The fundamental point of the Gospel, then, is the disciples' realization of who Jesus is. He is the Christ, 
the Messiah. This is also an important point for the readers. This is the good news that Mark is conveying through the form of his gospel. It is taken up by Matthew and Luke who expand on it. His face and garments became luminous like the sun and blazing light, a visual representation of his deity. Just as the glory cloud or Shekinah represented God's presence in the Old Testament, the sight foreshadowed what the Lord Jesus will be like when he returns to establish his kingdom. He will no longer be known as the sacrificial lamb, but as the Lion of Judah. Everyone who sees him will recognize him as God the Son, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. As if that weren't enough, two prominent Old Testament characters, Moses and Elijah arrived and conversed with Jesus. This scene shows that persons who have died, such as Moses, have cognitive understanding and the ability to communicate. Together, they symbolize all those who make up God's kingdom, those who will be raptured and not see death, like Elijah, and those who will die and go to be with the Lord, like Moses. In addition, Moses represented the law, while Elijah represented the prophets. They represented the entire Old Testament when combined. They, together with the disciples, represent both the Old and New Testaments as they revolve around Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Matthew chapter 17, verses 4 to 6. Peter, who was always fast with the phrase when no one else could, remarked, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. He proposed building three shelters, one for each of them. While he was still speaking, a dazzling cloud appeared and a voice said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God the Father interrupted Peter to validate his one and only son, the King of Kings, both verbally and visually. What were the disciples' reactions? They were afraid and fell face down. They had the foresight to take the holy and all-powerful God of heaven and earth seriously. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Matthew chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. When Jesus touched them and encouraged them not to be scared, the three disciples looked around and saw just Jesus. Why? Because Jesus isn't merely one among many faithful servants of God. He is superior to them all. The ministries of Moses and Elijah ultimately pointed toward Christ. All of Scripture has Him as its focus. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. He urged them not to tell anybody about the vision until he was raised from the dead as they descended the mountain. If the crowds heard about it, the story would most certainly confuse them and force them to proclaim him king. Instead, it was to be part of their kingdom message, inviting sinners to put their faith in the rising king. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. 
But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 to 13. The vision of Moses and Elijah prompted the disciples to ask Jesus why the scribes say that Elijah must come first. Jesus pointed out the reality that Elijah had already come. As he told them previously, John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. In the Gospel of Luke, the angel told John's father Zechariah that his son would go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. The trouble was that the leaders did not see John in this light. Instead, they persecuted Jesus as they would the Son of Man. There were three people involved. The first was Moses. Jews view Moses as one of the greatest leaders, but Jesus is even greater. In the Gospels, Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah, but he is plainly the greater one. For Jews, Moses was the second most important figure in the Old Testament after Abraham. His reign as an Egyptian prince was cut short when he lost his temper with one of the Egyptian slave drivers and killed him forcing him to flee for his life. The statistics about Moses' life are intriguing to read. At the age of 40, he spent 40 years grazing sheep in the wilderness before returning to live among the Israelites for another 40 years. God's hand was clearly visible. Moses' meeting with the Lord through the burning bush is also remarkable, if not because of the bush itself, but because of Moses' reasoning. God instructed Moses to remove his shoes first since he was on holy ground. He then assured Moses that he would lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses devised five reasons why he should not do it. First, he claimed to be insignificant. He then claimed to be uninformed and to have nothing to say. His third justification was that he would be unable to persuade the people that God had met with him and commanded him to lead them. God promised Moses that his word would be with him and that he would accomplish wonders. Then Moses admitted that he was a poor public speaker with a stammer that prevented him from putting sentences together. As a result, God appointed his brother Aaron as his mouthpiece. God has chosen not to divulge anything about the events surrounding Moses' death. There are three references in the Bible to Moses' death and burial, and each of these passages adds to the mystique surrounding the great prophet's life and death. He was 120 years old when he died, according to the evidence. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. Moses was still in his prime when he was called home despite his age. Moses died alone, with his back to the rock on the top of Mount Nebo, staring across the Jordan to the Promised Land, but one he would never see. Moses was barred from entering the Promised Land because of his disobedience at the waters of Meribah Kadesh. He led the Israelites to the very edge of Canaan and was given a glimpse of the land, but he was not permitted to enter it. God gave Moses a glimpse of the land he had fled Egypt for near the end of his life. Elijah was a Tishbite from Gilead, in the Transjordan region, and was regarded as one of the finest of Israel's prophets. Although there is no book written in his name, Kings covers more of his life than most of the kings themselves. He is best known for his confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is 12 miles long and juts out into the ocean in the north of Israel. At the eastern inland end, there is a large depression just below the summit where 30,000 people could gather. Elisha the plowman took over as prophet after Elijah. 
he requested a double portion of his spirit from Elijah, a word that is frequently misconstrued. It does not imply that he desired to be twice as powerful as Elijah. It was a phrase borrowed from inheritance practices. If a man had four sons, his fortune was divided into five when he died with the eldest son receiving a double portion to help with the responsibilities of the family company. In requesting a double share of Elijah's spirit, Elijah was requesting to be his heir and successor, allowing him to take over the company. Elisha was told by Elijah that if he saw him die, he may be his heir. Elijah was one of the Bible's few people who never died. Enoch was another. According to the scripture, he rode into heaven in a whirlwind, and Elisha witnessed his departure. When Elijah's robe dropped to the ground, Elisha picked it up and walked to the Jordan River. Elisha's ministry got off to a great start, with God separating the river for him and telling him that he would be with him just as he had been with Elijah. According to the Bible, Enoch and Elijah are the only two people God took to heaven without them dying. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 tells us, Enoch walked with God, then he was no more, because God took him away. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 11 tells us, Suddenly, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Enoch is described as a man who walked with God for 300 years. Genesis chapter 5 verse 23. Elijah was perhaps the most powerful of God's prophets in the Old Testament. The tales in the Bible of Enoch's translation and Elijah's removal from the world reveal nothing about what happened to them after they were removed from the earth. We can only assume they did not experience death on earth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 17. The presence of Moses and Elijah with Jesus is noteworthy. The name Moses was associated with the Old Testament law given to the people of God. Jesus came to fulfill the law's commands and to do what the law could not, namely, to find an answer to the issue of sin. The Torah identified the issue. Jesus provided the answer. The transfiguration provides further evidence that Jesus was the divine Son of God. It is not coincidental that this happened soon after Jesus had acknowledged himself to be the Christ, the one who left heaven's glory to come to earth. Now three of his disciples were to get a glimpse of that glory. Elijah was an outstanding figure in the Old Testament. He was a great prophet, and his appearance with Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration testified that Jesus fulfilled the prophets as well as the law. The voice of God the Father confirmed Jesus' calling and sonship even further. He admitted that Jesus had pleased him with what he had said and done. It represented his coming kingdom. The transfiguration scene of Jesus is a representation of his coming kingdom in its fullness. Jesus himself said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16 verse 28. The transfiguration occurred with Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Moses and Elijah miraculously appeared with Jesus. At the foot of the mountain were the remainder of Jesus' disciples and the multitudes. When one considers the numerous individuals and groups involved, a wonderful picture of Jesus' impending kingdom emerges. Jesus himself. First, there is the Lord Jesus in his glorified body. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. He will rule in his coming kingdom in his glorified body.